Thank you, Fraser, and thank you for the invite. Um, can you all hear me very well down the back? More importantly, can you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so I'm a nutritionist, I'm not a medical doctor. Um, oops, better click ahead. Uh, and I guess my research interests really are in the area of nutrition and musculoskeletal health, and specifically, what treatments will work from a nutrition and a diet standpoint? Because at the end of the day, we have to eat food. Um, and obviously, using diet particularly um, as the first line of uh, prevention and potentially treatment for musculoskeletal problems makes a lot of sense for a lot, a lot of different reasons. So I'm going to talk specifically in my 10 minutes slot about bones. And I know my colleague Emma next will, will talk about uh, muscles. So a little recap to begin. How do our bones help us? Well, obviously they provide essential mechanical support and protection for our internal organs. But fascinatingly, bones also are metabolically active. They perform a range of metabolic functions um, despite the sort of dull appearance uh, of them. And some of these functions, particularly in when you look at regulating mineral homeostasis in the body, particularly calcium and phosphorus and magnesium, these uh, minerals are essential for normal day-to-day -day biological actions like nerve transmission, muscle contraction, uh, and so on. And bones are continuously being built up and broken down during our life stage. So this is a small, succinct depiction of what bone formation is, uh, which is the formation of mineral in the bone, but also bone resorption, which is the degradation. And this process is very tightly regulated uh, by various hormones in the body. But importantly, we know that nutrition can influence the rate that bone has been built up and broken down. And I'll talk to you about some of the research that we're doing in this area. Now, I can't do any talk on diet and bone health without mentioning osteoporosis, um, historically called the silent disease, because patients only realize they have it when they suffer a fracture and they're sent by their doctor for a DEXA scan, and lo and behold, their bone health comes back as osteoporotic. So this is a condition of fragility with decreased bone mass, but very importantly, you get that microarchitectural deterioration of the mineral uh, and how it's orientated within the bone. And that deterioration contributes to the fragility and the increased risk of uh, fractures. And what you see there is a healthy bone on the far right and then an osteoporotic bone, uh, which is quite porous, uh, as you can see in the diagram. And sadly, there's a fracture related to osteoporosis occurring every 30 seconds. So that's 20 fractures, sadly, by the end of my 10-minute talk. But we do know that osteoporosis is influenced by a number of different factors. And this is, I know, quite a complex diagram. It shows you um, the inf impact of aging and the menopause, for example, on uh, bone loss, and obviously sporadic factors and disease. But if you look at the top left-hand uh, corner of the chart, you see genetic factors, which typically explain about three quarters of the variation in osteoporosis risk but nutrition and lifestyle are well-established determinants of bone health at all stages of life. And this is important because, sadly, not yet, we can't modify our, our genetic composition, but we can modify our diets and our lifestyle. And there's been a lot of research done over the last 30 or 40 years looking into the dietary factors which are involved in the development and treatment of osteoporosis. But if you narrow it down to uh, a few, and this is a report from the US Surgeon General, uh, which basically summarizes the factors which we know there's a cause and effect relationship between the factor and bone health. We can narrow it down into, and I will say it in order, uh, physical activity is a well-known determinant of bone health. Uh, and I'm not gonna talk about that uh, today. Um, I know Emma will, will mention that in the next uh, presentation in relation to, relation to muscle. But calcium and vitamin D, these are well-known determinants of bone health for individuals uh, of all ages. And calcium goes back decades in terms of its um, therapeutic value in 
not only preventing, but obviously treating osteoporosis. And calcium is very topical at the moment because there is some evidence out there that suggests that actually calcium supplementation, particularly doses above 1,500 milligrams, which is twice the daily recommended value, might actually be causing some harm in some people. And this is a very hotly debated topic about what is the optimal level of calcium for bone health. And what I can condense this into one slide is, is by saying that here's a position statement of the National Osteoporosis Foundation and the Associ Association of Surgeons in Primary Care. And they've evaluated all this complex evidence over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. And it's reassuring that when you look at the conclusions that in light of the evidence available to date, calcium intake from food and supplements that does not exceed the upper level, and the upper level is uh, 2,500 milligrams. So that's roughly four times the adult recommended daily allowance. And just to put things in perspective, a glass of milk will have about 250 uh, milligrams of calcium. So it's 10 times uh, that amount. If you maintain your calcium intake within that uh, ceiling, then that's considered safe uh, from a cardiovascular standpoint, so you need not worry. Vitamin D is quite topical for many different reasons, and vitamin D has a long-standing link uh, to bone health, and it's been the subject of a number of government reviews in the last three years, and I've just picked the one in the UK, which was released in 2016 by the Department of Health, and this is the, um, the body, the Scientific Advisory Committee for Nutrition uh, in the UK, which is charged for uh, publishing uh, nutrition and health reports for the government, and they've evaluated the the dietary requirements of vitamin D, uh, and they've actually found that the requirement is now 10 micrograms per day. Previous to this requirement, the value was a big fat zero. And the reason why it was a zero was because there was a lack of evidence up to that point suggesting that British people rely on our diets to maintain normal vitamin D levels. Because as some of you may know, Vitamin D is called the sunshine vitamin. We make it in our skin upon exposure to sunlight. But if you sit in dark, grim Newcastle for the year, and for many of those months you're not getting any vitamin D, well then, it emphasizes the need to get more dietary vitamin D. But when you look at what the intakes in the population are, they're five micrograms. So they're half the recommendation. And the vast majority of British people have intakes of vitamin D below the new recommendations. And this was highlighted recently in a report by Public Health England, which stated explicitly, there is a recognized need to increase population vitamin D intakes. And I'm sure you probably all know that oily fish is by far the best source. But unless you're consuming oily fish a few times a week, the reality is you're not going to get the amount of vitamin D that you need. So there's an increased need to develop nutritionally enhanced foods. And I've been doing some of this work, uh, which is funded by Industry and Innovate UK. Uh, and one of the foods we're looking at enriching, believe it or not, is eggs. And eggs is, a not, is an interesting food because eggs no longer have the cholesterol warnings on them like they once used to, used to have. And the, the whole uh, decimation of the industry by Edwina Curry in the late 80s uh, has also subsided. And I'm pleased to say that uh, egg consumption is growing 3% per year in the UK. So why eggs? Well, the interesting thing about eggs is that if you feed the chickens more vitamin D, then you actually get an increased vitamin D in the egg. And we've done experiments, and this is one of them, uh, a big industry scale uh, trial. And we've done it with Noble Foods, which is the biggest producer of eggs in, in the country. They produce 120 million eggs per week. So the reach is pretty good. Uh, and we've actually shown that when you feed the hens enriched vitamin D, and I must say all safe within European limits, and in fact, without going into it too much detail, there's calls to increase the vitamin D requirements of chickens as well for the same reasons as humans. What we see is we see a 43% increase in the eggs in vitamin D content. So we're getting nearly a 50% increase relative to standard eggs. 
We've been successful recently in a new project where we're trying to look at that in terms of how we can actually bring this new egg to market. What does it take to actually commercially produce these eggs? And one of the big areas that we're interested in is, is giving volunteers enriched eggs versus regular eggs during three months of winter time in Newcastle. We're going to take older adults, over 65s, and we're going to see if consuming these enriched eggs actually has an impact on, on diet and musculoskeletal health. The next study that we're uh, involved in is, is an industry trial with uh, Danone, which is a nutritional supplementation of uh, older adults with protein, uh, vitamin D, and a number of other minerals. Uh, and this is a, a, a a part of that work which we're just about to submit to Osteoporosis International and what we've shown is that when, when you give older participants a supplement containing 25 grams of protein and 20 micrograms of vitamin D every day for 12 weeks you actually see significant changes in bone turnover and very surprisingly small but significant effects on total body bone mineral density. So we're about to submit that to um, uh, Osteoporosis International. And lastly, uh, just a, br a brief note on selenium, which is an antioxidant nutrient, and it's uh, found in bones and muscles. It's not one that we traditionally associated with bone, but there is evidence epidemiologically to say that uh, it is associated with bone mineral density and hand grip strength. And by far the major source in the diet is bread and cereals and meat and poultry. And we're doing a study uh, together with colleagues at Sheffield, um, an intervention trial looking at whether or not consuming selenium in the form of a supplement for two years has any impact on bone health and muscle health in postmenopausal women. So this is to be continued. So take home messages, prudent advice on calcium, vitamin D and diet. Well, they're up, as you can see. Keep calcium at doses no greater than 1,000 milligrams in a supplement. If you're not taking supplements, then you don't have to go in taking supplements. You can certainly get good sources from dairy breads because it's made with calcium carbonate in the flour, and some green vegetables also contain calcium. Uh, it is prudent to take a vitamin D supplement at 10 micrograms. You don't need any more than that unless your doctor tells you otherwise, um, and that's unless you eat oily fish. And the last point is maintain a healthy diet with good protein, uh, good amounts of fish, particularly white meat, and small amounts of red meat, and obviously lots of fruit and veg. Thank you. Okay.